Today, the DNA of a surveillance state. Hello again, it's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics, working on this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Consider this, the mobile phone in your pocket has GPS and the capacity to hold an electronic wallet to facilitate payments and so much more. It is the perfect surveillance device. Add this to the myriad of cameras in public places and even in regional centres too, and the state has the DNA to impose and control where we go and what we do. We already give all the GPS data from our phones to our state governments in aggregated form because they are often quote the mobility data to tell us how effective lockdowns have been and how much the general population is complying with restrictions. And we know that in some ways China is leading the way with the development of a central bank digital currency, mass surveillance and of course all supported by social scores. Mass surveillance in China is the network of monitoring systems used by the Chinese government to monitor Chinese citizens. It's primarily conducted through the government, although non-publicised corporate surveillance in connection with the Chinese government has been said to occur. China wants its citizens through the internet, cameras, as well as other digital technologies. It's become increasingly widespread under the CCP. Mass surveillance in China is closely related to its social credit system and significantly expanded under the China Internet Security Law and with the help of local companies including Tencent, Dahu, Hikivision and ByteDance, among many others. Back in 2019, it was estimated that around 200 million monitoring CCTV cameras in the Skynet system have been put in use in mainland China. That's four times the number of surveillance cameras in the US. By 2020, the number of surveillance cameras in mainland China is estimated now to be something around 600 million. The coronavirus pandemic, of course, accelerated the implementation of mass surveillance and it provided a plausible pretext to roll it out. In 2020, Chinese law enforcement officials wore, for example, smart helmets equipped with AI-powered infrared cameras to detect pedestrians' temperature amid the coronavirus pandemic. The smart helmets used by the Chinese police also have facial recognition capabilities, license plate recognition and the ability to scan QR codes. And China is also rolling out big data and surveillance to inculcate positive behaviour in its citizens via the social credit system. In China's eastern coastal city of Rongsheng, for example, home of around 670,000 people, every person is automatically given 1,000 points. Fighting with neighbours will cost you 5 points. Failure to clean up after your dog and you lose 10. Donating blood gains 5. Fall below a certain threshold and it's impossible to get a loan or book high-speed train tickets. Some Chinese see the benefits. For example, high school teacher Xu Frang, 42, enjoys perks such as discounted heating bills and improved health care after a series of good works. Because of the social credit system, vehicles politely let pedestrians cross the street. And during a recent blizzard, people volunteered to clear the snow to earn extra points she said. But do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing and you risk being disconnected and so removed from society's normal function. Just consider though who sets the rules of the surveillance road. As the recent article in Time said, while few nations have embraced surveillance the way China has, it is far from alone. Surveillance has become an everyday part of life in most developed societies, aided by an explosion in AI-powered facial recognition technology. In 2018, London police made their first arrest based on facial recognition by cross-referencing photos of pedestrians in tourist hotspots with a database of known felons. A few months earlier, a trial of facial recognition software by police in New Delhi reportedly recognised 3,000 missing children in just four days. 
and later a wanted drug trafficker, was captured in Brazil after facial recognition software spotted him in a subway station. The technology is widespread in the US too. It aided in the arrest of alleged credit card swindlers in Colorado and a suspected rapist in Pennsylvania. But still, the risks are considerable as Western democracies enact safeguards to protect citizens from the rampant harvesting of data by governments and corporations. China is exporting its AI-powered surveillance technology to authoritarian governments around the world. Chinese firms are providing high-tech surveillance tools to at least 18 nations from Venezuela to Zimbabwe, according to a report back in 2018 by Freedom House. China is a battleground where the modern surveillance state has reached a nadar, prompting censor from governments and institutions around the globe, but it is also where rebellion against its overreach is being most ferociously fought. Here, of course, the talk now is the use of vaccine passports to control who can go where, and QR codes are the current first cab off the rank. This touches on the issues I discussed more than two months ago in my post, Bye Bye Privacy. As I said at the time, we risk losing something really important as QR code check-ins were being made compulsory. I said, then, it feels like 1984 got just a bit closer. Now, 1984, often referred to as the number 1984, is a dystopian social science fiction novel by the English novelist George Orwell. It was published on the 8th of June 1949. It was Orwell's ninth and final book, complete in its lifetime. Thematically, 1984 centres on the consequences of totalitarianism, mass surveillance and repressive regimentation of persons and behaviours within society. Orwell, himself a democratic socialist, modelled the totalitarian government in the novel after Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany. More broadly, though, the novel examines the role of truth and facts within politics and the ways in which they are manipulated. The story takes place in an imagined future, the year 1984, when much of the world has fallen victim to perpetual war, omnipresent government surveillance, historical retelling and propaganda. Great Britain, known as Airstrip 1, has become a province of a totalitarian superstate named Oceania that is ruled by the party who employs the thought police to persecute individuality and independent thinking. Big Brother, the dictatorial leader of Oceania, enjoys an intense cult of personality, manufactured by the party's excessive brainwashing techniques. The protagonist, Winston Smith, is a diligent and skillful rank-and-file worker, an outer party member, who secretly hates the party and dreams of rebellion. He enters into a forbidden relationship with a colleague, Julia and starts to remember what life was like before the party came to power. In Oceania, the upper and middle classes have very little true privacy. All of their houses and apartments are equipped with telescreens so that they may be watched or listened to at any time. Similar telescreens are found in workstations and in public places, along with hidden microphones. Written correspondence is routinely opened and read by the government before it's delivered. The thought police employ undercover agents who pose as normal citizens and report any person with subversive tendencies and children are encouraged to report suspicious persons to the government and some denounce their parents. Citizens are controlled and the smallest sign of rebellion, even something as small as a suspicious facial expression, can result in immediate arrest and imprisonment. Thus, citizens are compelled to obedience. Now, 1984 has become a classic literary example of political and dystopian fiction. It's also popularised the term Orwellian as an adjective, with many terms used in the novel entering common uses, including Big Brother, Double Think, Thought Police, Thought Crime, Newspeak, Memory Hole, 2 plus 2 equals 5, and Proles. Time included it in its 100 best English language novels from 1923 to 2005, and it was placed on the modern library's 100 best novels reaching number 13 on the editor's list and number 6 on the reader's list. In 2003, the novel was listed number 8 on the Big Read survey by the BBC. Parallels have been drawn between the novel's subject matter and real-life instances of totalitarianism, mass surveillance, and violations of freedoms of expression amongst 
other themes. And it's one that it's worth reading again because whilst it may have been set then, a lot of the issues are very now. And talking of now, Walid Ali wrote a piece in the SMH this week. Police accessing QR data violates our emergency pact. He wrote that if I told you that we could have maintained a zero COVID nation without resorting to any extended lockdowns, irrespective of the vaccination levels? And what if I told you that we already have the technology to make our contact tracing so fast, so near perfect, that it could outpace any variant? Simply use the data attached to each individual phone. That way, the moment you have a positive COVID-19 case, you can immediately identify every phone that came near that person and get them into quarantine. Then you could trace the phones of secondary and tertiary contacts. You can do it in a trice. Sure, that will end up being a lot of people, but you'll probably very quickly get to the point where all your new cases are among those already in quarantine. That will be so much more effective, he wrote, than relying on people to check in everywhere on QR codes because the data would be much more comprehensive. Think of it as a version of the Covered Safe app that actually works, or a more palatable version of everyone wearing a tracking device. Actually, come to think of it, he says, maybe we could just all literally wear tracking devices. That would probably be even more reliable than phone data lockdowns over. Except, he said, and the big except it is, except that is a truly terrible idea. I'll leave it to the tech boffins to explain all the potential disaster scenarios, how nefarious actors might be able to hack into some of our data and use it in nefarious ways. But for my purposes, he said, we need only consider the most lamentable ignored story of the week, which involves people we aren't meant to consider nefarious at all, our police. It turns out, in multiple states, They've been trying to access QR check-in data to solve crimes. They've even accessed that data twice in Western Australia without a warrant. That prompted WA to ban police from doing so. New South Wales police are prohibited under a public health order from using contact details provided for contact tracing. This week, the National Privacy Watchdog called for all governments to do the same. That seems especially relevant for Victoria, which is no ban in place despite having rejected police requests for access three times, that leaves Victorian police with the option of convincing a court to give them a warrant for the data. And the Victorian government seems happy to leave that in the court's hands. Meanwhile, in Queensland, we've seen a court grant exactly such a warrant. This isn't satisfactory because this isn't merely some legal matter. It's a fundamental political matter. Our governments are wields in extraordinary powers in an extraordinary time, greatly limiting the ordinary checks and balances that courts or even parliament would usually provide. That sort of indulgence requires citizens to confer on governments a monumental trust. Everything about this use of QR data violates that trust. In fact, it does it in two ways. The most immediate and practical is that these data are being gathered exclusively for public health reasons. We as citizens are being forced to participate in this de facto surveillance program and for the most part we happily comply for the very good reason that it's invaluable to contact tracing. But that only works if people have unconditional confidence that this data can't be used against them. How many times have we heard Premiers plead with the public to tell the truth to contact tracers, even if that means owning up to something illegal, followed by a guarantee that this won't lead to punishment. In a pandemic, we can't afford to create a single disincentive for people to obfuscate with contact tracers. And the mere possibility that police can use this data for any other reason will be reason enough for a number of people to stop checking in. But the second violation is even more profound because it goes to the heart of the pact we make with governments at times like these. We are in a time of emergency politics in which governments claim the right to do things that would be intolerable at any other time. Indeed, they're only tolerable now on the understanding that governments and organs such as the police will not abuse this power by using it for anything beyond the emergency itself. There is nothing normal about QR check-ins. They must therefore not be used for a normal purpose. But when the police request QR data 
they're using emergency measures for routine business. The fact they would even think to try suggests they don't understand the true gravity of emergency measures in a democracy. This is necessary, giving way to convenience. So it's a good thing we weren't using individual GPS data or tracking devices. Where we might still see a pact, we see a tool. And that whole mode of thought must be wholly impermissible because if it's acceptable for one emergency measure to seep into normality, there is no logical reason to resist several more doing the same. That's because non-normality is the very essence of emergency. To create an exception erodes the essential meaning of emergency measures. Once breached, the wall between emergency and routine measures ceases to be a wall at all. Perhaps given the nature of their work, it is naive to expect police not to try to breach it. But it is the task of elected governments to reinforce it. And that task is among the most vital tasks they have because that wall exists to protect our post-emergency selves. But the broader point is, the harnessing of technology is so alluring especially for states who believe the future is one of control and the capabilities are already there to make it happen. And frankly, many politicians will simply roll over on the grounds of security or crime prevention. But the slide into the surveillance state is frankly a one-way street into a version of 1984, where history is conveniently retold to benefit the incumbents, where certain views and opinions are silenced and the thought police won't be far behind. So we need to be careful and vocal to avoid this end game state where personal freedoms are reduced to a cipher. And by the way, the argument that it's no problem because I never do anything wrong is its own slippery slope because laws can be changed and suddenly you could be on the wrong side of the fence. This is not a question of technology but rather the political will to direct it for our mutual benefit or not. And coming back to the SMH article, absolutely, we need to ensure that emergency measures imposed for a specific reason do not morph into permanent changes which erode our civil liberties. Big Brother could well indeed be watching. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.